will in the study of professor you'll realize that at some point it was almost uh uh forming up or conjuring up um a theory uh in criticism uh which is another debate altogether but he was also interested in critical and theoretical perspectives of african literature he was also into performing arts and you you'll remember his engagements with uh, the likes of uh, john ruganda and uh, the first involvement in the department in terms of uh, working with the free traveling data as it was then and uh, his engagements with the likes of uh, david mailu and other uh, literary minds and persons which you will get to see throughout the webinar uh, attempting to explain to us who Professor Chris Wanjala was uh, isn't something that I can do with the limited time that I have uh, uh, in my disposal. But uh, I may want to remind us that he was a student uh, here at the university and uh, he was also a teacher uh, to the time of his demise. He has also had other professional engagements uh, at Egerton University, where he was uh, the chairman of the committee of inquiry that would later form what is now the Department of Literature in Egerton University. He also uh, was critical in terms of uh, providing a syllabus for literature, not only here in the university, with the likes of Ngugi Wazyongo and Anyumba, uh, but he was also instrumental in ensuring that uh, the discipline itself uh, in the wider nation of Kenya was uh, well taken care of. And this would seem involve himself in various and many uh, organizations, committees, uh, institutes uh, across uh, the country. And that is who Professor was, uh, to, to be a big person on uh, joining the university way back in 2017. I, I had heard of Professor through uh, his, his publications, uh, majorly in the dailies, and it was my aspiration or my dream to have Professor or Malimu teach me uh, through my four year study. It was not to happen, but uh, we, had, we didn't have sort of a personal interaction and uh, well, that, that's just life how it is and death has a way of robbing us of uh, people who are good and people who would have otherwise uh, helped us benefit a lot so um to sum up my my my, my brief statement i would i would, I would um, welcome us to to try and understand uh, the man that was uh, professor chris wanjala in terms of uh, I mean, broadly, the exploration of the webinar, you'll find that we'll, we'll try and get a sense of uh, the late professor in terms of uh, one is intellectual uh, contributions, and that is uh, specifically, I mean, broadly to literature and specifically to literary criticism. And uh, we'll, we'll also try and understand that is number two, um, is journey in literary journalism and uh, this is through uh, his publications in, in the dailies, his uh, engagement with uh, literary spaces. For example, the one that was provided by Kaika Okwemba, the veteran journalist uh, who is here with us uh, in KBC through Books Cafe and uh, KBC uh, as a whole. We'll also try and understand his position uh, in terms of intellectual Solidarities. Uh, you'd remember that he's the one who engaged the likes of Austin Bukenya earlier on. He was also key in terms of uh, being sort of an intellectual abinger. Because if, if you look at um, African literature, you'll understand that at some point, because of uh, uh, it's, it, the, how politically motivated literature is as a discipline, and how it, it, it has uh, tended to we at loggerheads with, with those in power. We will also try and see how he helped the likes of um, Eskiam Palele and uh, John Ruganda from Uganda when they, they were around uh, uh, the Kenyan capital that is Nairobi. And uh, finally, we will also understand um, Malimu as a teacher, uh, a teacher of literature, a teacher of performing arts, and a teacher of uh, orator. 
So at, at this point, I would like to welcome, um, I would like to welcome Mr. Sam Otieno, who will be our moderator of the day to take over. Thank you and welcome, Mali. Uh, thank you, Wambua, and uh, also uh, Dr. Kimingichi, and also uh, Professor Jen Odor, who's also uh, the chair of the department. Uh, now, mine is uh, the humble task of uh, moderating uh, this uh, session. And uh, even I think as we begin, uh, I'd like also uh, to appreciate the presence of uh, some of our members of, of staff who are here and uh, are not uh, part of the, the speakers. I'm seeing uh, we have Professor Moiseli is here with us. Uh, I've also seen uh, Professor John Harbo is here with us. Uh, Professor Shoda is also here. And uh, I, I also saw uh, Dr. Musonye, uh, Dr. Udari, and uh, even uh, Dr. Usaji uh, who, are, who are here uh, with us. Uh, if there's anyone that have not uh, uh, noted their presence, uh, I, uh, I think uh, we also appreciate you. Uh, I would also like uh, to request uh, those who are joining us to uh, let us have uh, our microphones on mute so that uh, we make it easier for those who are speaking uh, to be listened to. Yeah, and I think uh, even as we are here celebrating uh, the contributions of uh, Professor Wanjala, I think uh, someone said that uh, if I see far, uh, it is because of uh, the giants on whose shoulders uh, I stand. And Professor Wanjala, without uh, any doubt, was a giant that provided able shoulders for many of us to stand on and uh, continue our contribution to the study of literature in one way or, or the other. So uh, we have a, a lineup of speakers uh, who will share with us the uh, understanding of uh, Professor Anjala from uh, one perspective or the other. And uh, one of them is uh, the physical marker that Professor John Odor uh, was referring to. And this is uh, Dr. Alex Anjala, who's a senior lecturer. Uh, at the department. Uh, then you also have uh, Chris uh, Kaiga Okwemba, who's a, a presenter at KBC. And uh, we also have uh, Tony Mochama, who's a, a writer and even uh, uh, the secretary, uh, the secretary general of, uh, of, of, of Penn, uh, Kenya. And I think even as they give us their reflections on Professor Chris Wanjala, they'll also uh, give us an understanding or probably introduce themselves further so that we can have uh, 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 an understanding of who they are. But some of them are familiar names to most of us and we are privileged and are most fortunate to have them. So uh, I think at this point, I'll, uh, I'll welcome Dr. Alex Wanjala, who will now take us through uh, his, uh, his reflections on Professor Wanjala. Uh, Dr. Wanjala, you're most welcome. Um, thank you very much, uh, Sam Dennis. I don't know whether you can hear me and whether I'm visible to everyone. Yes, yes, we can hear you. Okay, thank you very much. I would like to thank all of you for gracing us with your presence on this uh, occasion. I know we are all very busy and uh, this is a very busy time at the university and in other places where we are drawn from. And uh, we do not take this on uh, lightly. I would like to especially thank the organizers of this event, um, starting with the chairman of uh, the Literature Students Association, Paul Wambua, who has done a lot just to make sure this uh, event has taken place. Uh, Dr. Kimingichi Wabende, who um, has been thinking about this for a very long time. We thought about it last year, but you know, the COVID situation was, uh, you know, ravaging at that time and uh, we were totally unsettled. So the fact that we are holding this um, online, uh, even at this moment, is mainly due to the work uh, done by uh, Dr. Wabende and uh, Paul Wambua. I would like to thank you for that. I'd also like to thank uh, Professor Jane O'Dwar, the chair, for kindly hosting us and gracing um, the occasion. Um, Mr. Sam Dennis, 
it's always a great pleasure to see you and thanks for the great job you're doing moderating this event. Um, I'm here to, you know, I don't know, I'm here wearing two hats. I'm uh, a son to Professor Wanjala and uh, this event, uh, you know, is a touching event to me because uh, three years down the line, I did not expect that uh, we would still remember uh, my dad so fondly and come together to discuss um, his work. We know that uh, sometimes we make promises and find them uh, difficult to honor as time goes by. So on behalf of the family, I'm very touched and moved by your presence here and by this event. Now, in terms of scholarship, I was uh, invited to this event as a discussant. I've not been given uh, a definite uh, topic to comment upon, but I'm quite impressed by the summary already given by uh, Paul Wambua. And um, I don't think I would have much more to give, but I'll try and uh, say one or two things, hopefully uh, that might trigger a discussion of the subject and that would be complemented by the presentations by the other colleagues present in the panel that we have. Um, we've been informed about uh, how uh, Wanjala uh, has a very long background within the Department of Literature. And um, what I would say is uh, probably just uh, try and uh, kind of come to terms with uh, the philosophy probably, or the, yeah, the philosophy behind his engagement with literature. We know he had a very diverse uh, contribution in terms of literary journalism, in terms of teaching, and in terms of uh, engaging in literary criticism. But I'd just like to bring this out kind of in a nutshell and uh, probably give us a chance to deliberate, de deliberate on the issues I might bring up uh, further because I've really not uh, brought out these uh, thoughts into any kind of uh, organized uh, presentation. What I'd like to say is that since its inception, um, the Department of Literature has really been engaged in the development of uh, African literature generally and East African literature uh, specifically. And uh, Wanjala played a key part in kind of elaborating or reflecting on these um, developments in literary criticism. Um, one would say, in fact, his greatest uh, task, which we see developing from the time uh, he starts uh, writing. First of all, um, he comes up with the ed editorial work of what would be the first comprehensive uh, study on East African literary criticism in 1973, which was titled uh, Standpoints in African Literature. And at that time, he was a fairly young scholar, but he really contributed uh, to literary studies through that uh, text that he edited and that covered uh, various debates in society at the time ranging from studies on uh, the works of writers such as uh, Pabitek, uh, Gugi, Taban Lyon, and others. And uh, from there, he goes on and in 1978 uh, comes up with uh, the text that uh, gives us the title of this uh, discussion today, which was Season of Harvest. And uh, that is uh, a kind of, uh, again, a monograph that uh, focuses on topics such as alienation in East African literature and uh, culture in East Africa and so on and so forth. This is then followed by another book, um, uh, Freedom of Harvest. I'm just looking through my library here. No, it's uh, not Season of Harvest, uh, For Home and Freedom. For Home and Freedom uh, that was published in 1980. And that is, uh, I think, uh, the 
published version of uh, his uh, PhD thesis. But it is from this point that he now starts working on developing a philosoph the philosophical underpinning behind his literary uh, criticism. And this is the growth of a literary tradition in East Africa. And it's reflected in an essay that he publishes in 1983 under the same title and a talk that he gives in 1986 in the, the Second African Writers uh, Conference that took place in Stockholm in 1986, uh, you know, which is again under the same title of explaining the growth of a literary tradition in East Africa. And finally, it becomes the subject of his uh, inaugural lecture that was given, I think, in uh, the year 2003. And in this, uh, he tries to follow how um, an East Africa, a literary tradition has been established in East Africa. So what is his discussion? What is it that, um, you know, he's trying to bring out through his philosophical uh, thought on East African writing, East African culture, and East African literature. In order to understand this, we must go back to the 1950s and find out what um, existed at that point in time. And very briefly, as uh, Paul Wambua tried to, uh, I mean, hinted at earlier in his uh, presentation, in the formative years of uh, East African universities, there was the development of the Makerere School of Criticism. This comes about uh, through those people who were taught at Makerere University by expatriate lecturers from universities such as Cambridge and Oxford. And they bring in, uh, they come to Africa with the great tradition of African literature. I mean, the great Western tradition, sorry, um, whereby you're dealing with writers, uh, I mean, with teaching the works of writers such as uh, T.S. Eliot, the criticism of F.R. Uh, Levis, and the practice of uh, what would later be known as new criticism, and the reading of what were seen as the best writers in the time from the West, people such as uh, uh, um, okay, I won't go dwell on the names right now, but I'll just say um, there are those uh, writers that one had to emulate. And these uh, writers were taught to people such as uh, um, Guki Vasiongo, uh, uh, Jonathan Carriara, probably people like uh, Rebecca Kanjau, basically the earliest practitioners of East African literature. So this is what we are calling the Makere School of uh, Literature. And we all know what happens thereafter with the foundation of, uh, of uh, the Royal College Nairobi and later the Nairobi College. And when Gugi comes back from Leeds and uh, you know comes together uh, with Henry Ward, uh, or Henry Ward Anyumba and uh, Taban Lolyong, and they argue for the decolonization of the literary um, curriculum. And that is how the Department of Literature comes into being in 1970. And from that, that point in time, um, we have the teaching of literature starting from East Africa and then moving on to other parts of, uh, I mean, th this is the focus of the curriculum. The teaching of, of literature would first start from a focus on East Africa. Then you move on to other parts of Africa, and then you move on to other parts of uh, what is now known as the Global South, such as the Caribbean, uh, India, and other places before you get to the West. These were the golden years of literature in the University of Nairobi, the 1970s. We see a lot of literary activities uh, and the dissemination of these ideas, the decolonization of curricula, moving from uh, the university, first of all, to high schools, and then later on to primary schools. There's a lot of engagement with the public, uh, as is demonstrated by 
the play Gahika Denda and the Kamiritu uh, Theatre Project, among other things. Of course, this debate goes on, and uh, there's a debate about teaching oral literature in high schools, which comes about, and this is all, all these activities are part of that uh, golden age, which ends, of course, as we know, with the detention of Ngugi in uh, around 1978, and arise in dictatorship, not only in Kenya, but in other areas of um, Africa. And therefore, at that point in time, it became very risky to teach literature. We know how people were being detained, people were being fired, books were being uh, destroyed, the livelihood of authors was under siege. As a, or Anger Sieke, as a police uh, commissioner would say sometimes. Uh, but, you know, people find a way to get out of this. And we must respect the practitioners of literature at that point in time, because um, being under such uh, political oppression, they had to find ways to survive. And how did this come about? This came about by the faith, going back to the faith uh, practices of teaching literature, in that instead of focusing on extra textual elements, they went back to um, the tenets of uh, new criticism, whereby one would look at the text, study its themes, study the elements of style, and so on and so forth. And this was really the faith practice. Again, add, adding on to that, uh, you know, neo-colonialist neo practices, whereby um, the center, the center of publishing moved from where it had been, Africa in the 1970s to the West due to capitalist, uh, uh, you know, capitalist tendencies and the ne neoliberalism that installed itself in African society. So you find that uh, it is the West that starts dictating to Africans what a good paper is. And this process has been, you know, described by the uh, critic, Biadun uh, Jeifo, as the time of arrested decolonization. Arrested decolonization because the dream of decolonizing the literary curriculum in Africa was arrested at this point in time. And the imperial nature of the world, the capitalist nature of the world, made it such that uh, we went back to another form of colonization, which has been termed as uh, neo-colonialism. And uh, Beardin Jaifo therefore describes these two distinct schools that emerge as the nationalist school and the Africanist school. The nationalist school is that school that strived in the 1970s, you know, that aspired towards the decolonization of African literature, whereby extra textual elements that come out through literature were privileged, that literature can be a tool for sensitizing society about the ills of either colonialism or neo-colonialism, et cetera. And it is very well captured by the work of Gugi with the Kamerizu uh, project. And uh, on the other hand, we have what is referred to as the Africanist school. The Africanist school although is that school that privileges not the extra textual elements in a text, but just focusing on the text you know, the safe kind of reading of a text that will not agitate people into action. Remember, there was this uh, existential uh, uh, kind of thought where, as uh, Jean-Paul Sartre had earlier said, what is the commitment of the author? What is the engagement of any author in changing society, which had been quite fashionable in the early 70s, such that uh, Ngugi would question Papitek and ask him in right, his writing of Song of Prisoner, why is it that the prisoner is just dancing? Are you just writing poetry for the enjoyment of the elite? Or are you going to write poetry that will uh, kind of give 
the public an impetus to move towards revolution, you know? So the African school does not really engage in such uh, uh, practice of sensitizing the masses, but just focuses on art um, for art's sake. And uh, it is more well established in society and gets the finances of uh, uh, the Western uh, powers that start controlling the study of literature, even on African soil. But we have this time of engagement where many scholars go uh, are exiled in the West. Many scholars, many writers are silenced here in Africa. Uh, many scholars are appointed to government positions. The department in itself, you know, is uh, kind of uh, censored because everybody fears speaking to the other person. Now, at this point in time, uh, Wanjala coming through with his uh, thoughts on, you know, the great, uh, the uh, literary tradition in East Africa kind of uh, tries to start thinking of a middle ground, you know, a middle ground between these two competing schools, between the nationalist school and the Africanist uh, school. And uh, this is where now he studies that tradition that has been in existence. He defines the Makerere school. He defines the song school in East Africa. You know, the writers who came up with the songs such as uh, um, Accord to Biltek, uh, Boruga, and others. And then he defines uh, fiction, prose fiction in East, in East African literature, and then popular fiction as another school of writing, and so on and so forth. And he now comes up with a critical stance on how to read the current trend of East African uh, literature philosophically. And uh, he bases his critical stance on readings of T.S. Eliot, um, Ezekiel Mfalele or Eskia Mfalele, as you may wish, Okot Pabitek, in order to argue that, uh, you know, the literary continuum in East Africa is uh, one that uh, is based on the traditional activities, uh, you know, derived from orator. And the modes of composition that are drawn from the creative ethos of the writer, the writer himself, the writer who is engaging in composing that uh, uh, literary text, not in the past, but the writer borrows from that oral past and now writes about the present uh, moment using his or her, her own creative genius to describe. And uh, that, that writer would, uh, you know, shape the material taste of their own uh, generation, which reads literature in indigenous languages and literature in foreign languages. Therefore, what he's telling us is that we as uh, critics had to discern, had to use our own training and knowledge as East Africans to kind of uh, distill all these elements in literature, in the literary text the traditional oral elements, the writer's uh, ingenuity, and the material concerns that reflect the ethos of our present moment in order to come back, to come up with a study of what now we would define as, uh, you know, East African literature. In other words, we are identifying oral traditions within written literature and kind of coming up with a general uh, corpus, if I may say, that does not you know, separate what is uh, African 
from what is uh, Western. I've just tried to make this uh, uh, this definition in very uh, simple terms. So in other words, uh, Wanjala identifies and uh, recommends a critical ideology that is a middle ground between the nationalist school and the Africanist school that uh, I just uh, uh, defined earlier. Uh, and I would say that uh, in a way that was the philosophical foundation of his uh, literary thought and is something that uh, would need further discussion and further development because it is in a way in opposition to um, the school of thought that uh, Gugi has come up with in uh, decolonizing the mind and other texts in which one should totally eschew all these Western um, elements such as language and all that. But Wanjala is focusing on the existence of texts that are written in English, but he does not really stop there. He also, even after, and this is the continuation of his work because his work did not even stop. At uh, his inaugural lecture, he was challenged about literature that exists in Kiswahili and uh, that he had ignored such texts. And you find that in, in later years, he now adjusted and incorporated the study of Kiswahili literature of Fatihi within his uh, critical um, corpus. So I've just uh, tried to very roughly and in a very simple manner, uh, try, uh, you know, define his uh, critical thought and his contribution uh, to the establishment of a literary tradition in East Africa, and more specifically, um, his awakening of the world to the existence of an area of study which should be developed further, which is um, East African literature. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Wanjala, for that uh, uh, session on, uh, on, on, on the intellectual history and also uh, the intellectual uh, philosophy and contributions of, uh, of Professor Wanjala. Uh, now, I would also like to draw uh, the attention of uh, uh, our, our online audience to uh, the reactions uh, at the bottom of, uh, of your screen. So if you want to uh, clap, uh, probably uh, raise your hand if you want if you if you want to ask a question uh, you can use the reactions uh, at the bottom uh, of your screen now uh, I don't know if uh, Hainga Kwemba has uh, has joined us uh, he's uh, he's he's uh, he's uh, supposed to uh, be taking us through the next session uh, but uh, before then uh, I, I want to invite uh, Karen uh, to read uh, a poem uh, Karen, uh, I don't know if you're here with us. Um, good afternoon, everyone. I hope you're all well. Um, I'll go ahead and read It Hurts Mwambu. It Hurts, O oh Mwambu, the way we wear our capes. Is it a mistake, O oh Mwambu, that when I was born, on my head there was a black cape. We are all your children, O Mwambu. After eating our morning teeth bits, we wear our capes. Hitherto cherished, inevitably, enviably possessed. We are all ready to chase locusts, butterflies and honey, until dusk and the black pot summons us back. Is it a mistake, Sela and Mwambu, that some of us wear a black cape? Surely it seems, Mwambu, for those you give white capes, wave your word as a jingle. They wave their swords over the plots you gave us for, ya for, for young farming. It does seem so, Mwami, for this word and this sword, from breakfast to roost, Welihe well, in the south knows no joy, his plot, his pigeons, 
his bows, all are in the hands of those who give white capes. The other day, my savior, those who give white capes came with a curious story and put it on my plot. Me and my friends in, in black capes egged to fill the toy with our fingers. The toy, my mambo, vomited ash and fed on, fed on us and those you gave white capes. Upset us from what we are sitting, upset us from what we were sitting and carried our three-legged stool away. Now though me and others breathe well, where well, his spears are now digging sticks, he grinds flour and picks firewood. For those you gave the white capes to warm their bellies with, he keeps saying, Oreo mai navalosi. Thanks, Mother Navalosi, for every smack in his face. Now, though me and others breathe well, Welihe, the boy who came from the river with soil on his head playing with jingles, Welihe who stood in his father's homestead until birds of all sizes fell and died, stands ailing because of the cups you gave us. Oh, Mwambu, my voice is hoarse. But is it a mistake that when I was born, a black cape was put on my head? Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Karen Wasomi, uh, for that reading. Uh, Dr. Kimingichi is uh, making sure that you hear. He has clapped uh, for you. Uh, thank you very much also, Dr. Kimingichi, uh, and also the ones who are using the reactions. Now, uh, there's a question at the comment section. Uh, I, I don't know if it's addressed to Dr. Anjala. Uh, before we go to our next presenter will be Professor Helen Mwanzi, but there's a question in the comment section. Uh, now, someone is asking, this is Enoch Matundura. He's asking, why did Professor Anjala ignore Kiswahili literature at first? Can one talk of East African literature uh, without Kiswahili literature? So, uh, I don't know if uh, Dr. Anjala, you are in a position to respond to that question. Uh, thank you very much uh, for the question. It's a very interesting question. And um, I think uh, um, that question was uh, well responded to by uh, the late uh, uh, Professor Ken Walibora, uh, in a tribute he gave uh, about uh, uh, Professor Wanjala after his uh, uh, passing. Um, however, just uh, to attempt, I, I don't think I, I really have the answers here, but just to attempt uh, kind of to answer this question, I would not say that uh, he had completely ignored um, Kiswahili literature, because he had a very good understanding on how uh, Kiswahili literature had uh, developed, especially from the perspective of uh, um, the teaching of Kiswahili literature in uh, the University of Nairobi. He used to describe how um, Kiswahili was part of the literature department and indeed had a lecturer assigned to it in the Department of Literature, but when the Department of Linguistics was formed, or when it broke away from uh, the Department of Literature in 1971, the lecturer who had, uh, you know, been assigned to teach the course went away together with the subject to um, linguistics and African languages. Um, in developing his uh, ideas on the growth of a literary tradition in East Africa, he had especially now focused on the development of these different schools, but he did not really incorporate uh, uh, Swahili texts in his analysis, unless I'm mistaken somehow, uh, but would later in his writings through uh, the media and in his teachings of uh, a few courses after his uh, inaugural lecture, would demonstrate his knowledge of Kiswahili literature over the years. 
so what I was saying was that in his inaugural lecture, he was questioned about why he had not covered uh, the growth of Kiswahili literature, which is a mistake that, uh, you know, he acknowledged uh, at that point in time. And as probably our colleagues from the discipline of uh, uh, Kiswahili would inform us in a better manner, he tried to cure that by effectively engaging and showing the world that uh, he was now, you know, participating in the discussion on the development of uh, FASI in East Africa. I hope that answers the question in, in a very general way, although I know I don't have the definite answers. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Angela, for, for, for that answer. Uh, now, uh, Paul Wambua, I wanted to react to the question. Yeah, I think it would it would amount to a sin of omission if, if you were to accuse professor of having the uh, having having neglected Fasi as uh, as it is or Kiswahili. Because uh, I mean reading seasons of harvest, you, you you will agree with me if you have uh, if you have checked out uh, uh, that that collection that at some point he was even he, he was questioning uh translation in terms of availing literature in in, in Swahili. And he was giving an argument of um, trying to translate um, uh, Russian text, for example, I mean, contextually in, in, in that um, in, in, in that essay, he, he was giving that example of uh, trying to translate um, Armatov, for example, and he was arguing that um, for for so I, for for literature to flourish uh, in East Africa, we need to be we need to translate. And he was actually clapping his hands for Mwalimu uh, Nyerere uh, for, for, for his translations of the Merchants of Venice, for example. So I think uh, he, he was invested in it only that um, perhaps the canon hasn't focused on, on him doing as much uh, in that regard. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Wambua, uh, uh, for that reflection. And I think uh, the contributions of uh, Professor Wanjala uh, to the study of literature, East African literature, I think go beyond uh, what uh, some of us would even have uh, yeah, have imagined. Because even as we talk about uh, the study of uh, Kiswahili literature in East Africa, I think before uh, the webinar started, uh, I was talking to Dr. Tomo Diambo, and uh, he 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 told me that it is uh, partly because of uh, Professor Anjala that he went and studied popular literature, and uh, even today. Uh, as we debate, uh, as we engage uh, in debates around uh, Kiswahili literature, we can also equally uh, engage in debates around uh, popular literature in Eastern Africa and also their place uh, in, in, in the study of, uh, of literatures from, from Eastern Africa. Uh, now, uh, I would like to invite uh, uh, Professor Helen Mwanzi to take us through uh, the next session. Uh, Professor Mwanzi, uh, I can see uh, you're with us, so uh, you're most uh, welcome. Thank you, Dr. Anjala, for that uh, historical reflection on, uh, on on Professor Chris Wanjala. Good. It has muted. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, welcome, Professor. You um, thank you, uh, scholars, students, and everyone uh, whom I would refer to as uh, literary enthusiasts or literature enthusiasts. Uh, good afternoon. It's a great pleasure, pleasure for me to just talk about Chris. I will not go into, uh, I may not be gentleman, I knew very well, a scholar par excellence, if you speak French. Are you, do, you under, do you hear me? Am I audible? Hello? Yes, you are, Prof. Yes, you are, Prof. We can hear you, Prof. Thank you. Uh, for me, Chris is one of the greatest scholars that the University of Nairobi did produce. He was a scholar a literary icon, 
the first PhD graduate of the University of Nairobi. And I must say, therefore, the mentor of all those who have uh, done or studied PhD in the University of Nairobi. It gave some of us the University of Nairobi or in one university, in an African university. I think I should emphasize that. In an African Kenyan university from uh, first degree, second degree, and third degree, that one need not uh, alienate oneself because for your studies in order to get PhD, something that uh, I've lived to appreciate and admire, uh, Professor Christopher Lucorito Wanjala. Uh, from him, I learned that one can also run a successful family and yet be a serious scholar. In his time, quite a number of colleagues of his did not have very serious families. They were more married to texts and had serious issues. But Chris held both. The signs of it are our very own uh, Dr. Alex Wanjala, whom he mentored and said that he's actually going to be put that title. Congratulations, Alex, for being. I look at or I think about Professor Wanjala. I think about the lively debates between him and um, Ngugi Wadiongo, the lively debates between him and um, the, or the, uh, the oral literature, Bandolion, and how Chris maintained impatience for oral literature in the early years of his uh, scholarship and dismissed oral literature as an area for people do not, who are not ready to peruse um, textual, literary, written texts. People only wanted to listen and dance and write something. And they would deride the, those colleagues. And for me, I found that uh, very intriguing. I loved it because I loved oral, oral literature and uh, I was good, smart at it. But, but I did not take offense. In fact, Chris' criticism moved me closer and closer to oral literature to the extent that as he matured, we, in fact, that the team uh, with the Wanjiku Kagera also, and we traversed this country, picking oral testimonies, uh, oral materials from young people, from elderly people, and that is actually um, uh, its legacy. Taking the university to the people, taking the students of, of uh, education in Kikuyu campus to the country about we about four, four, four counties or five, you know, just getting the young people, listen to old people talk about uh, themselves, talk about the history of Kenya and record and come to analyze the literary works, the, the literariness of their presentations and the language uh, uh, of it. Now we wonder when we ask ourselves, was Chris interested in Kiswahili literature? I think Chris was one person who had a passion for literature in whatever language. Chris attended conferences that were mainly, actually uh, vastly um, held in um, Italian, whatever, the French and others. And he would, he would go there and he would come and he'd tell us. And also Chris of the dialogue. I think that is one thing that we need to revive so much. That's why I prayed that my machine what helps me or enable because literature grows by dialogue, interaction, and enjoyment. It is not a study where you need to browse and, and, and suffer alone. You, the more you share, the more human you become and the more I enjoy literature. And that was Chris's way of...
handling literature. As a result, he grew so passionate for literature that one would say uh, he is one of, that University of Nairobi has produced because he not only studied and taught, but he also uh, uh, lived it. He loved the company of literary thinkers, you know, and a, a pioneer scholar of this department of literature, uh, Chris mentored many because he loved symposia. He loved symposia. And uh, he, when we were undergraduates, for instance, we had several um, workshops, symposia, symposia. Uh, the magazine was lively. We sat and we, Saturdays were set aside, Saturday evenings were actually set aside for just symposia, talk literature, write a poem and give me, except for write a poem and give it out to the people. And Chris was um, very lively in that, and he drew many of us to that, those circles. Um, so when I joined the 1960 champion of literary studies, and so uh, I can also say that debates and the deriding, those debates between uh, among the, the, our, our teachers, of my teacher was, Chris was only one year ahead of me. So those debates between, among our teachers, which when Chris joined them, even at master's level, he was already engaged in them. And they were, what I, what I uh, called Uchongwano. They bordered on Uchongwano to the extent that Ngugi um, told Chris, if you don't like facing him on Kenya, because Chris would say that facing around Kenya is not Kenyatta's writing. It's just somebody else who did it. And, and this really. Not much and so on. And then Google, so Google asked, then go and write about Hotel Gone. You know? Jealous that Kenyatta has emotion. And I think the product is actually that he did write that novel. And in it, one can, one is actually surrounding Mount Elgon, running around Mount Elgon, seeing Mount Elgon, feeling the heartbeat of Mount Elgon, the, the mourning and the crying and so on. And now that I've lived there for quite a while throughout COVID, thanks to COVID that pushed me to uh, this kind of teaching and, and interaction, I've been able to interact a lot in the drums of death. Funerals are announced by death and they move. And Chris did that, uh, introduced it. Chris was passionate again about popular literature. And uh, I would ask him, is, is there literature? One, for one, you say serious literary studies. And then you talk about popular. Isn't there a contradiction between popular and serious? How do you marry the two of them in your, in your head? And you would say, well, popular, and it would give you a very elaborate definition of popular literature. In fact, uh, when he was, uh, by the time, when he left us, he was still, um, Four of us, I think he, my uh, Anjiko Kavira, Monica Museri, and I were already thinking around writing um, a, a book with chapters on popular literature vis a vis what is called, uh, what we call serious literature, because we wanted to delve into it. And we would sit in the senior common room, sometimes without even taking any. Just thinking about popular literature. What is it? Is Mailu worth studying? Was Mailu worth studying? Quite a number of texts in Kenya today. A literature that will not be popular after 30 years. 
30 years from today, they'll not be popular because they'll catch the human soul as it is, you know, from the time, uh, just the human soul, the humanity it is not really neat. It is about uh, the inflation, but it doesn't go further. And so we are thinking along such lines and then the Lord God had his way and took him away from us. Uh, when Chris, a public, the Department of Literature. And it, uh, I can say that there's so much to say about Chris Wangela uh, that I believe a whole book should be just there for essays, various essays on Chris Wangela and the, his contribution, because it is vast. It is vast. He was, not, he was a shy man, strangely, a very lively debater, but basically shy. Again, then there is some kind of paradox in that one, you know. Uh, in other words, he was a, a difficult person to understand. He was courageous and yet shy. When it came to when it came to making his point in literary studies, he was very firm, very clear, articulate. But then again, <laughs> you know, still he was a, a shy person. As a result, he was not showy as as it were. I think that is um, the, the idea that it was all, that's what I would say. It wasn't showy, but very deep. And so I would say um, the study of literature actually can be said to be a study that molds, in that case, the Swahili literature was at his, you know, he loved it because he understood, he spoke Swahili well. He was in this. Um, the men learned Kiswahili. I am very poor in Kiswahili. I don't speak Kiswahili very well, but I read Kiswahili novels, whether I understand them or not, but I do read them. I, I, I understand the general and I understand the, the depth because I listen to young people. And one thing before I stop is that um, Chris is passionate, passion for working with young people was also something to note. He liked bringing young people into a circle and uh, he had several caucuses just he, he just had several symposia and caucuses for young people that's why he liked to go to schools to talk about literature to talk about writing and to talk about the the the, the, the importance of disciplined writing and we went again with him to several schools in several counties, again, just uh, talking about literature. Now, this is something that I say he's so shy because when Gugi and, uh, and Kot and Taban uh, went to a few schools in Kenya in 1972, it has become like the only, 1972 it has become like the only exposure, the only uh, time when literature was taken to the people. No, Chris Wanjala, took literature to the people, but it's not one who would come and say, I have done it. it wasn't, he, he would not be just thumping, saying, I have been to schools, have you been there, and so on. He did impact young people greatly, and a wide suck of them in the various schools, both uh, when he worked, he went to Western, and I'm sure he'd been there several times, he went to um, uh, Nyeri, he went to uh, um, uh, Meru. He visited all, many, many places just to talk about literary studies, to talk about, to get all the material and to talk about writing. A very, um, a, 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 a passionate writer who was a member of Penn and he wanted as many young people as possible to join Penn. Do you see him bring them on just to join that I admire this one up to today, that he would, he would not keep what he knew others would benefit from. When he learned about color, you know, when he learned about oral literature of the world, international, you know, uh, international society of oral literatures of Africa, he said, no, no, we can also have a branch in Kenya. Kenya association and he founded that a particular uh, uh, association
I say it's shy because they weren't very exciting. And yet he did not even do us. He founded that, the, uh, the, the one for uh, uh, Kobo, you know, where we are talking about the rights, the rights of the author. He founded that. He we went to Norway for a, while, a conference, a symposium, comes back with the idea and uh, disseminates. So what I'm emphasizing is his love for dissemination of knowledge. Chris did not die with his knowledge. Chris disseminated his knowledge. And as I speak like this, I'm praying that I don't die with my knowledge, that actually I disseminate it. Well, that is what Chris lived for to let others know because he thought he believed in knowledge being power without saying knowledge is power. He was not invited to uh, the idea of knowledge is power. And the young people are the important. They must get this knowledge, invest in them and invested in a lot of young people. And uh, his, his students, the dialogues with the students if you have interviews with them, they bear me out that actually he lived for that. And he respected writing. He wrote, Chris was a prolific writer. He wrote things down. And when, uh, I think when the family has, has access and time, uh, compiling what Chris has written will produce another five volume or so. I believe Alex is working on it. And I think uh, I need a whole day, but again, I say thank you so much for welcoming me, for inviting me. Just to talk to young people about the importance of literature. Literature shaped Chris Wanjara. Literature, one that was so deep high and it's so effective. And with that, I say, May his soul rest in peace because, you know, at least he lived to retire and he left legacies. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Mwanzi, for that uh, insightful uh, reflection on, on Professor uh, Chris Wanjala. I think even uh, your session, you've hinted on uh, some of the conversations that you're going to have today. And uh, I think uh, a central one is uh, uh, the issue of debate because we, are, we, we have someone, sorry, the issue of uh, mentorship. Uh, we have someone, a speaker, uh, this is Fred Kimoto, uh, who will be coming up next, who will be talking us, to us about uh, uh, being mentored by Professor Wanjala. And also I think uh, one of the things I've, I've, I've noted from uh, Professor Mwanzi's presentation is uh, you brought out the debates that Professor Wanjala was uh, was engaged in. Yeah, uh, I mean the debates on uh, popular literature, the debates on uh, on on Kiswahili literature, and even uh, his contributions just beyond uh, the study of uh, of literature itself as a discipline, but even to the the practice of of, of literature. How do we uh, ensure that uh, the rights of uh, of those who write? Are, are protected and, 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 and respected. And even beyond that, how do we uh, disseminate knowledge uh, as, uh, as, as, as students and scholars of, of literature? Uh, once again, uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Mwanzi, uh, for that session. And even uh, those of us who are watching us on, on YouTube, uh, I'm seeing uh, there's uh, uh, Teddy Nalwanga who's uh, appreciating uh, Professor Mwanzi for your presentation and also uh, the presentation by, by, by Dr. Wanjala. So uh, I think we will listen to uh, Fred Kimoto as uh, we prepare to listen to Hainga Okwemba in, uh, in conversation with uh, Professor Wanjala. So uh, Fred uh, Kimoto, you're most welcome. Uh, thank you, Sam, for the opportunity. I hope you can all hear me. Yes, we can. Oh, yeah. Thank you so much. And uh, I know a lot has been said on Professor Wanjala, and I'm glad today that I'm sharing with you uh, some of my moments with him. And uh, some, if you could allow me, 
uh, because one of the injunctions of one of the groups that Professor Wanjala formed and introduced me uh, is a church group, a church writers group called Pen Adventures. And I don't know whether we have anybody from Pen Adventures who can just say hi here. Flora Hall, Dr. Melvin, are you here? Yes, we are here. <coughs> hi. Please say something in one minute. All right. <laughs> hi, all. I'll try to see how I can use a minute. My name is Flora Kesa, and first of all, I'm very honored to be with you, especially the Literature Students Association of Nairobi University. So I serve at Parkland's Baptist Church. Uh, that is where I actually met Professor Wanjala in the year 2016. And he put together a group of people, and together they formed the a Writers Club, which we call the Pen Adventures Forum. Eventually, we go to publish a book. Unfortunately, we published that book after he passed on. And uh, apart from the book publishing, there is something particular I noted about Professor Wanjala. I used to organize the forums for Parkland's Baptist Church. Anytime he comes in, he'll always stroll in with someone new. Uh, some of them lecturers, publishers, editors. Sometimes I'll feel, will, will he not tell, it will be, more convenient if you told me so that I make special arrangements for the guests, but that was not happening. Okay, after he passed on, a lot of the people who he brought in that team, they're the ones who actually helped us to publish the book. That was two years later. And a lot of them, they are not even from our church or the congregation we sit in. So I was thinking about mentorship, and then I was thinking, Professor Wanjala, it's not just about the talk, but mentorship is actually a catalyst to bring about leadership, to bring about legacy, and he actually made it happen. Uh, for so many of us, it was the first time to call ourselves authors, because I happen to be a contributor of the book, and that's the first book published with my pieces on it. And uh, even as I just hand back to Fred, uh, I would like to say one day, and I'm very happy to, to, to just also listen to Alex, Dr. Alex, when he was talking, he was talking like a 90 year old seasoned guru in literature. But I'm just thinking, however, how he emanates himself is beyond what he's learning from class but he's also absorbed a lot from people who have gone ahead of him. And you can actually see he planted a seed and the seed keeps bearing fruit years even after he left. And I do believe even it has already happened that even as we look at the literature history, we can't fail to mention Professor Wanchala. And that is actually science of true legacy. I am glad to have met someone who has made history in Kenya. And I'm sure maybe, and it is my prayer also that the seeds he has put in us, one day we are also going to learn and to pick up those mentorship seeds and also bear fruits and also help others do the same, the true meaning of mentorship. I'm so glad to be here. God bless you. I'll hand it back over to Fred. Yeah. Thank you so much, Flora. Uh, let me introduce myself. My name is Frederick Kimodo. I'm a former student of Professor Wanjala. Uh, one of the units that he taught me is Kiswahili literature. And uh, I just wanted to comment something uh, uh, from the discussion uh, about Kiswahili literature. And I can remember that our first introductory class back in 2017, uh, he asked us actually to identify authors of, uh, authors of Kiswahili works, especially novels from the, you know, the Bara side of Kenya. And that was one something which challenged me and some I think it can be part of our discussion. Uh, I want to say that I moved around with him for the, for the few months that or years that I met him. And I can remember uh, one of the days when we are just moving around town, we were looking for his watch to be repaired. And this actually will make us distinguish one of his characters about you know, the literature, the way, it, the way literature was flowing his blood. And uh, there was, you know, the way in towns they use music as an advertising tool. 
And so one of the questions that he asked me was like, why are these people putting loud music? And I told him, you know, this is a way of advertising. And actually he asked me where, what literature I could derive from that. And so for me, I would just say that everything to him was literature. Either like you hear her music sounding somewhere, you see a tree growing around the university. I see a matatu in, the, in town or anything that happens to him, it was literature. And for me, for me being a student, actually, uh, that's now where my literature, like uh, my, my love for literature began because first of all, I was in school, I am doing literature, but again, I don't even know the reason why I'm doing literature. And one of the questions that he asked me was the reason why I was doing literature. And at the moment, I did not have a response. But on my reflections later, I just came to learn that we don't study literature because we are able to read books or because we are able to like read poems or, be, or their, our ability to write. But, but it's actually something that we should, uh, something that is inside us. And it's something which makes us young to study literature. And uh, for me, it was a great moment to interact with him. Uh, there's a time I, was, I went to do internship at Moran Publishers. And one of the projects that we were doing at the moment was the publication of the anthology, uh, Memories We Lost, that he edited. And for me, uh, interacting with a professor like him, uh, I can't really say that uh, like it was a moment for, for him to showcase his literally prose. But for me, I found that I, I wasn't an editor. I didn't know whether I was a critic because I'm, I'm just a student and just like a normal student, I just want to like to criticize the work, but I really don't know even which approach I can use. And for him, he used to tell me that, you know, in literature, this is what you look for, this is what you do. And for me, that for me was a great mentorship. And so uh, somebody mentioned about his smile. He was ever in a smile. And apart from having a smile, he was really a kind man. My first time to get uh, to enter a senior commons room was through him uh, because that's where he used to do most of his works. And uh, sometimes you just go to uh, another hotel, especially I can remember an hotel we used to go called Gracia Gardens in Kilimani. And we just, he just buy us tea. And from there, we just talk about literature. And one of the questions that he used to ask me when every time when we met was, how many texts have you written overnight? And I tell him, oh, Prof, you know, my, I was just revising the notes. Uh, I was just revising the notes. So I was reading for examinations or cuts. And you know, you just tell me, if you wake up in a day and then you do not write anything, then consider your day to be like, like you have not achieved anything. And one of the days, uh, and one of the things that he used to tell me was, whenever I just get out of my house and I do not carry a novel, I am like kind of a failure. And these are the things which I consider, uh, which I consider like they were modeling not only me, but I know he was also modeling other students and also other lovers of literature. Like, like whenever I'm in a matatu, what do I do? Listening to music, it's literature. If I'm I, I, I'm, I'm just observing the trees, then am I even able to, ha to come up with, up with a poem on the scenery that I'm seeing around Nairobi? And, and so for me, I used, uh, I, I just came to know that, you know, there were things that he was not telling me, like, um, this is what I want you to do, or this is what should happen. But, but in a way, from his discussions, I, I realized that there was a way he wanted uh, uh, like my, me as a student and a student uh, and the person who I didn't know yet my focus on literature like, like this is just a suggestion of what I can do I can do and uh, one of the things again which amazed me he just used to invite me to, to his classes I was studying in main campus and one day he just tells me let's go to Kikuyu and I ask him prof what's happening in Kikuyu he tells me I just want you to go with me and so going with him, uh, one of the days I, I remember it, I, he was teaching a South African literature class and uh, myself, I had not yet studied it because I think I was in, in the, I was in second year and I was yet to study it later in my third or my, in my fourth year. And uh, from there, even when I was studying uh, South African literature later in my third year, I had an idea of whom Alex Laguma was. 
And one of the things is that uh, his classes were not just like a, like a lecture. Actually, most, most of the time is the students who used to talk most of the time because he just initiated debate and you know the classes, you know, they will just get lit because of the discussions which were happening in the classes. And I think his model of teaching is one of the models that I've always admired. Me and Wendy. Marcy, please. Thank you. I really admire this model. And uh, some of the students here, um, whom we, we were in the class, I think it's one of the qualities that we always found so unique of him. Because when we were studying any work of literature, when we were studying any unit of literature, he always brought speakers. Like I can, I can remember one, of, one, one, one day he asked me whether I have ever read about, uh, I, I have ever read about David Mailu. And I told him, yeah, I have read two of, it, of his texts. And actually he called Mailu and he told him, you know, I have a student here who has read two of your works and he would like to say hi to you. And it was one of my most uh, moments uh, or my pleasure that I was able to have a discussion with Abel, uh, uh, with David Mahilu. And even if in one time he also arranged for us to visit him in his home in, I think, somewhere in Machakos. And uh, one of the things that uh, we'll all find about him, uh, and I think Professor Mwansi has mentioned, is that he would attend seminars even for, uh, for, for works that were not, are not even done in English. And I remember one of the days we attended uh, a, 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 a seminar in a, in a some hotel in Westlands, and it was and, people, and the discussion was the Indian literature, Indian poetry. Sorry, it was done in in, uh, in Hindu. And one of the things which actually uh, which actually came to me was that you know he was ready actually to learn from anybody. The works which are done in Hindu, actually, we did not even understand Hindu. We did, but he actually, at the end of the meeting, he asked me what I what like what I could deduce from the meeting, and I told him, you know, I can't understand Hindu. So later, he told me that you know, uh, you should actually do a critical study on uh, on Indian literature and also Indian poetry. So for me, I would say that he challenged me to do a lot of studies. I I always found. Uh, uh, I always found pleasure to interact with an old man, you know, like my age, my, my age gap with him was so huge. But again, he also found pleasures with, uh, to, to be with me sometimes. He would call me, he would, we know we could chat, sometimes we could chat even in Facebook. And uh, we have, I have heard people uh, in, this, uh, in this discussion talking about uh, popular literature. For me, I would say that it was my first time to get introduced to popular literature, although I didn't know that it was popular literature, but I came to know later when I was in Dr. Tom's class. And so I think these are some of the things which we are like uh, in literature we, we, we are seeing. Like for instance, he asked me what I could deduce of the of what we are, what is happening, especially in the WhatsApp and in Facebook, where people are just creating moments through memes, uh, which are present. One time, I remember I called them memes, and uh, these are some of the things I think which uh, just they just hyped me to 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 start studying some of these things which I couldn't think before. So I'll say that his mentorship was not like he just wants to give you a motivation talk like the way most of the motivational speakers, you know, they'll tell us that there are two, there are 21 days to succeed in English. But just looking by uh, looking, looking at him, going with him, sometimes you are spending time with him, you would learn a lot. And it's, it's, not, it's not a point of view asking him, like, what can I do here? One of the, one of the days uh, we were just walking from senior commons room and he went, he was going to pick his car at the parking lot. And he asked me whether there's anything unique I could see in high slope building. And to me, the whole But he asked me whether I knew that, whether that was uh, like uh, uh, Hindu writings. And I didn't know at the moment. So for me, he didn't just, I didn't just ask him to, uh, to tell me things, but he'll just, uh, he'll just tell me just even without asking him. And sometimes he will even try to, he will even try to provoke my thinking by initiating things which I didn't, I didn't think I could even start with them. So I really appreciate for the time I spent with him. 
And uh, I, I just wish that uh, we, we just continue with this legacy. And this is just by continue to study literature. And I know that we have some of the literature gurus here. I've seen Professor Humphrey, whom we, we discussed about, about his works in Kiswahili literature class. So I'll say that uh, I'm so thankful for the opportunity. And uh, I just know that this is a discussion which is going to go a long way. Uh, and it, and I, I, I'm just looking forward for a colloquium which actually will lead to publishing. Thank you so much, Sam. Back to you. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Fred. Uh, I think his, your account uh, of uh, Professor Anjala, and also I think I can also attest because uh, uh, when I was still doing my MA, often I would see you and, uh, and Professor uh, Wanjala together. Uh, and even uh, when uh, the anthology of, of, of poetry uh, when, when was on, its, uh, on, on the pipeline, I remember you uh, asking me to look at some of the poems, and I think it is quite a challenge uh, to uh, those of us who are uh, progressively getting older, because as uh, scholars of Swahili say, ujana ni maji ya moto. So definitely, we will, uh, it will also be required of us to mentor others, uh, as I say, to whom much is given, uh, much is expected. So thank you very much, uh, Fred, for that. Uh, reflection on, on the mentorship by Professor uh, Chris Wanjala. Now, uh, I had indicated earlier that we will listen to uh, Professor Wanjala in conversation with uh, Hainga Okwemba, and uh, uh, this will also be, uh, I think, after, after, after now, the conversation between Professor Chris Wanjala and Hainga Okwemba, we listen to uh, Tony Mochama, who's just uh, joined us. So uh, I think I'll, I'll, I'll just present uh, that uh, uh, presentation. Yeah. Books Cafe, your literature program on K Welcome to the Books Cafe, your literature program on KBC English Service. I'm your host, Kainga Okwemba. The Books Cafe is a cutting edge program in the world of literature where we talk to writers and explore contemporary literary issues. On this day, on the Books Cafe, we celebrate one of the greatest literary minds from Africa, Professor Chris Wanjala. The celebrated Kenyan literary critic and towering professor of literature is gone, gone to the land of his ancestors. Professor Chris Wanjala was until his departure East Africa's foremost literary critic. Professor Chris, welcome to the program. Thank you so much, Mr. Hainga. Now, Prof, you teach at the University of Nairobi, but you are better known as a critic. What does it take for one to become a critic? Well, uh, one has to go through the educational mill. In fact, uh, perhaps when you go to school, you don't know what you'll be in the future. And especially at the time I went to school in the 60s and uh, a good part of 70s, I only realized that uh, I was going to be a literary critic when I joined the University of Nairobi uh, in 1968. But even then, when I did the first semester, what I knew was that I was just a good student of English. I loved poetry, I loved uh, fiction, and uh, I loved drama. Well, for me, I didn't have that level of a, a literary critic at the time. I was just a student of literature. So what I could say is that uh, to be a literary critic, uh, one has to start uh, as a lover of literature, a student of literature, and ultimately a practicing debate on books as they arrive and uh, on issues literary as they emerge in the public domain. There was this scholar at the university, Adrian Rusko, and uh, Adrian Rusko actually got you into the realm of literary criticism. If you could just revisit that path, how you began. Adrian Rusko uh, was a British scholar who was a lecturer at the University of Nairobi. I think he joined the university around 1968 as a lecturer, and he had just finished his PhD on Nigerian literature. He had studied writers like Wallace Shoinka, J.P. Clark, Gabriel Okara, and so on. And when he came uh, to East Africa, he had a lot of interest in 
publishing and also discovering new writers. So he launched a journal called Nexus. Later, the journal changed its names many times, but he was the editorial advisor of this journal. So in the process, he is the one who actually initiated me into uh, literary criticism. Because when I joined as a first year, he challenged me to review Mbiti's poems, poems of nature and faith, and uh, also to review uh, Joseph Brugger's uh, a poem called The Abandoned Heart. So that was my very first attempt at uh, literary criticism, and he challenged me to actually write that essay, and he published it in Busara, the journal where he was uh, the editorial advisor. And uh, since we interacted so well, during the holidays, as a student, I never went home. So again, he arranged for me to work with uh, a publishing house where I was helping young writers to get published. You are just a new student at the University of Nairobi, and then you found yourself now becoming a literary critic, yes. having published that first essay on poetry. That's right. Now, eventually, you became a critic. Uh, ultimately, in the same department, I was uh, elected to become the chairman of the writer's workshop in the department when I was a second year student. And uh, that writer's workshop meant that uh, I prepare materials from young writers around campus. At that time, there were no computers. Uh, we only used uh, manual typewriters. So I stenciled those uh, works, and then I call a meeting of uh, young readers in one of the social halls at the university, and uh, we began actually analyzing those literary materials. Then eventually, even the lecturers used to join us in the evening. You know, even the head of the department was at that time Professor Andrew Gar. And uh, interestingly, even uh, journalists like uh, Philpo Cheng and uh, the late Alo Ojuka began coming to our halls of residence to attend our literary events. So I became a kind of weekly critic of materials from fellow students at the university. Of course, later on, you would belong to that very exceptional league of Abiola Ilere and Louis Nkosi. Abiola from Nigeria, West Africa, and Nkosi from South Africa, and you emerging as a pioneer literary critic from East Africa. So if we were to look at some of the books or writers that emerged, your contemporaries, the ones that are, we could look at as canonical books in that period, because that is the period that we always want to relate to as giving us the first books by Africans. At the time, uh, I was sort of getting engaged, because after my undergraduate studies, I joined uh, the department as a, an assistant lecturer. With my first degree, I began teaching, and uh, then after that, I got involved in fact, in editing a book called Standpoints on African Literature. And this book uh, contained essays from fellow students and also uh, lecturers in the department. And I was even able to get uh, contributions from uh, Uganda, from such uh, critics as uh, Peter Nazareth. So in a way, my pioneer work was uh, The Season of Harvest, which is uh, a response to uh, Taban Lyon's uh, The Last Word. Because Tabani argued that uh, there is a literary barrenness in East Africa, but I argued that there was a season of harvest where new titles were coming, and maybe Tabani was just being deaf to the idea that, in fact, we were flourishing uh, as, a, as a region. So with that kind of debate, in fact, I first met uh, Louis Nkosi at a conference in Kampala in around 1973. And uh, we began to relate very well. We became instant friends. Later, we were meeting internationally overseas. And Abiola Rele also passed by. And there is a, a literary critic from Nigeria called uh, Kole Omotosho, who published an article in uh, Afriscope, a journal that was published in uh, Nigeria. And uh, I was very delighted. In fact, Ngugi and I were very delighted when these critics put me at par with uh, Irele and uh, Louis Nkosi. It was just a pleasant surprise. But in any case, afterwards, again, the three of us met in uh, uh, Frankfurt in uh, Germany. And it was so good, uh, Irele representing West Africa and Nkosi, South Africa, and I representing East Africa. It was uh, a, a, a moving, quite an experience for me. Now, Prof, they say that at one time Nairobi was a melting point of culture where we had all these literary scholars from Nigeria, South Africa, Uganda coming to Kenya. But then those ones were different because 
at least after those events there are moments that were defined you know statements made like for example when Christopher Kikbu attended the conference in East Africa at Makerere he said that I don't write my poetry to non poets you know he became to be defined as that poet his poetry was very difficult but so many events happening today but not those very momentous you know things that you could look back to and say that ah what is happening in our literary movement to the prof well one thing is quite clear uh the 1960s and 70s that was the time of cultural nationalism where africans were trying to answer back to the western world which had argued that there was no literature in africa africa had only darkness and uh, darkness cannot be a subject of literature so there is a way in which uh, africa was answering back and uh, fortunately for the african writers they were imitating european writers because a, a writer like christopher kigbo whom we are talking about he wanted to be a citizen of the world write like european writers borrowing heavily from uh, classical greek from the roman catholic imagery and so on and then uh, sort of merging it with the uh, ibo culture like one of his poems where he talks of mother idoto uh, to you i come in my nakedness in other words he wanted to rediscover himself uh, and so on and also basing his uh, poetry the movement of his poetry on classical music so there is a way in which uh, people at that period wanted to show that they had mastered western modes of composition now when it comes to the present generation of writers they don't have that commitment that the older writers are talking about because the older writers saw themselves as part and parcel of the voice that was rejecting western culture and uh, bring about decolonization and they saw writing as a mission a writer was a public figure just as well as a, a politician and uh, they met on an equal basis and the writer when he wrote he to someone a lot of discipline so that he can match other writers from the rest of the world but at the moment a writer writes one draft of a poem and straight they are looking for a publisher they don't know that a poem takes a long time to perfect prof as a critic you also are a historian you know a spokesperson of your contemporaries of your generation for somebody who is coming to east africa what are some of the books that defined those moments that you tell them to read even the youngsters who are interested in literature today what are some of those very good books and writers from east africa from that generation well i must say that uh, the content of our literature has been changing according to our socio economic situation for example during the uh, the ali period ngugi came up with the uh, books like the river between whip not child and a grain of wheat uh, some of those early books are still worth reading uh, i'm thinking of uh, a grain of wheat it's a very accomplished novel in terms of style and uh, management of characters and so on uh, ngugi became a bit of a propagandist afterwards so his later writings it's as if he's putting his uh, thumb in the scale to tilt it so that the reader but in the earlier works like a grain of wheat is more balanced and uh, as an artist he's controlled and uh, maybe that's why his winning of the nobel prize might take time because he has to sort of uh, detoxicate himself so that he remains an artist not a, a political commentator or propagandist so i would recommend still a work like a grain of wheat to a reader who arrives if you are just tuning in This is the Books Cafe on KBC English Service and I'm your host Hainga Okwemba. Today we have a special program in memory of the giant of African literature and East Africa's foremost literary critic Professor Chris Swanjala. Professor Chris Swanjala was for many years and until his death the most senior professor of literature in the country. So the professor Ali Mazrui of course is better known as a professor of political science many people looking at him as a pan africanist a philosopher a historian let's talk about his legacy as an intellectual you know professor Ali Mazrui is one of these scholars who also came up with the definition of who 
an intellectualist. It actually happened at one time when he was debating uh, this very influential personality in Uganda in 1967, if I'm not very wrong. And the session was in the town hall chaired by the mayor of Kampala, and he was debating this gentleman who was the head of intelligence. And during that debate, actually, he defined who an intellectual was. And he said that an intellectual is a person who is fascinated with ideas and has acquired the knowledge and skill to try and address them in the best way he can. Well, one thing is that uh, Ali Mazri came back, joined Makere University College. At that time, there were only a few expatriate scholars who are debating in nationalism, African nationalism, nationhood, the role of universities in uh, development, and uh, indeed uh, the role of the scholar in development. So there is a way in which uh, he also got an opportunity to relate with the editor of Transition, Rajat Nyoji, and uh, together they formed quite a climate of uh, intellectualism. And uh, at the time, because Mazrui's uh, upbringing prepared him very well to be very close to the ruling elite, such as uh, Obote himself and uh, Bernard Doko, the gentleman that you are mentioning, to the extent that he could actually debate with them on issues and so on. And it is in this kind of uh, arrangement, discussing the role of uh, the intellectual, the role of the scholar, that Masri more or less defined a scholar that reflected his own performance as uh, an intellectual. Because when he said uh, an intellectual is a, a person who is fascinated by ideas and who can handle them effectively, that was really more or less defining his own role in the way he was uh, relating to politicians like uh, Obote and others. And he, being brought up in that uh, Western uh, kind of premise of uh, the Western rhetoric, the debating kind of culture that he had acquired when he was in Oxford. And also, you must remember that uh, Mazrui is an African Arab. He refers to himself as an African Arab. And uh, he grew up in a classical Arabic intellectual culture. His own father was a writer, a pamphleteer. And there is a way in which Mazrui comfortably grew in an intellectual environment. He was not a stranger to ideas. So when it came to being uh, in Makerere at the time in which he was, he was then very comfortable when it came to fulfilling that role as uh, an intellectual right. or as a scholar. Now, Prof, you actually mentioned Ali Mazuri also looking at Chinua Achebe's thing fall apart. I actually happened to have read that piece, uh, that essay uh, that he presented um, when Things Fall Apart was celebrating 50 years after its publication. Maybe if I could just read a few excerpts from there uh, so that uh, you can make sense for us on this program, Prof. So, Professor Ali Mazrui writes that there are at least uh, three genres of literature within which uh, Things Fall Apart uh, may be located. One school is the literature of post-coloniality. Although the book was published two years before Nigeria's own independence, it is a work which evaluates colonialism by describing that kind of Africa the imperialists encountered on their first arrival. Achebe himself has often spoken of things fall apart as a response to the white racism embedded in such works as Joseph Conrad's Heart of Darkness. Another genre to which the novel might be placed is a school of what has more recently been designated the genre of clash of civilizations. It overlaps with the literature of imperialism and post-coloniality, but imperialism was only one illustration of civilization in conflict. Joseph Conrad's book Heart of Darkness was one such overlap between the literature of imperialism and the literature of clash of civilizations. Chinua Achebe has himself held very strong views about Conrad, especially on the issue of race. Okonkwo, in Things Fall Apart, is of course a defender of his civilization. And then Professor Ali Mazuri asks, is Things Fall Apart a celebration of traditional Igbo culture, or is it a de facto an apology for westernization? There are Igbo traditions portrayed in the novel, which the author knew were repugnant to Western sensibilities, such as Igbo mutilation of a dead child to deny the child's spirit a re-entry back into this life. 
and was the killing of Ikemefuna by Okonko, the father, whom he trusted an act of barbarism. Or was Okonko playing God as the father, facilitating the crucifixion of his own son? Does things fall apart have more in common with Joseph Conrad's heart of darkness than Chinua Achebe has been prepared to acknowledge? This is Professor Ali Mazrui again after looking at that tragic story of Christopher Kikbo, now taking on this very famous uh, masterpiece by Chinua Achebe, Things Fall Apart, and he writes about it. I think uh, it is a very superficial kind of uh, uh, understanding of uh, Things Fall Apart. And uh, even the use of his language does not uh, bear what we call literary criticism. For example, he's talking about themes as if they were genres. How can you call a a cultural conflict as a genre? There is a way in which uh, he is completely unaware of the terms that are properly used in literary criticism. And uh, he is uh, making very wild comparisons between... Chino Achebe's novel, Things Fall Apart, and uh, the European poetry that he has read, and also uh, Joseph Conrad. What is lacking in this uh, statement by Ali Mazrui is actually the ability to understand characterization in a work of literature, and also to understand the themes that are overhanging or overhacking in this novel. Well, it is true that uh, Things Fall Apart is an act of postcoloniality in the sense that it is a novel about conflict. It's not actually a tragedy. It is a tragedy in the classical sense of the word because Okonko is the man at the center of the story. And this clash, this tragedy comes around because of uh, the conflict between traditional cultures where uh, a man like Okonko is supposed to uphold certain values like manhood and uh, to try to show responsibility. You know that in this novel, Okonko doesn't want to be a replica of his father as an image. His father in the novel is portrayed as a weakling, uh, somebody who just likes art instead of uh, making wealth and so on. So there is a way in which uh, Okonko is trying to move away from the image of his father. But then he is also confronted with the presence of the white man. Now, the presence of the white man is threatening his own masculinity as a man, as a father, as a a, a leader. As a leader. Yes. Yes. So, because of this, he has to fight against that. He has succeeded. He has, uh, because the novel starts with the the wrestling between Okongo and some other wrestler. But we also, we are shown that he has succeeded in accumulating wealth. His granaries are full of food and uh, he has a family. So this is not just a cliche. Here, Achebe is using art to demonstrate that post-colonialism. But when he says Achebe is celebrating some form of barbarism, just like uh, Joseph Conrad, I think he is failing to see the dialectic, the movement in the work. How does the work move? And then how does it end? On which note, what is the ultimate message of this novel? At the end of the novel, Okonko commits suicide. What does that mean? That means giving in, more or less. Uh, It's a tragic acceptance of the issue of change. You know, change has come and he has to perish. When change has come, either you change or you perish. So in the case of uh, Okonko, uh, Okonko, he actually perishes. And uh, his own son joins the white man. What does that mean? The son becomes a symbol of the new culture, acceptance in a way. So there's a way in which, uh, in the way the novel moves, Achebe accepts change. So when it comes to killing Ikemefuna, this is just one of the tragic flaws. You know, the novel is a classical tragic you know, text. And in tragedy, you'll find characters killing those who are nearest to them. Like uh, in the tragedy of Shaka the Zulu. Shaka the Zulu kills his own mother in order to survive. He turns to the nearest and the dearest and kills them. But in the case of Okonko, he kills Ikimefuna. 
because of Congo is focused on showing his own valiance, his own uh, bravery. He does all those things. So that is part of his undoing. And in a play, in a tragic play, just like in Homer or in Shakespeare's plays like Othello or uh, King Lear, you find the undoing of the main character. The character becomes blind to certain forces which undermine him. So in this circumstance, Achebe uses the minor characters like Ikimifuna to demonstrate the folly of Okonko and uh, to also show that he was so hell-bent to fight against colonialism that he could not see that there is need for change. That is the literary giant that was Professor Chris Wanjala. And with that, we come to the end of this special edition of the Books Cafe in memory of Professor Chris Wanjala, one of Africa's greatest literary minds and East Africa's foremost literary critic. That was the reason he earned himself the moniker, the father of East African literary criticism. As in the words of South African poet Oswald Michale, I say this, Weep not for him, he was a great warrior. Let him rest on the buffalo hide bed where his forefathers repose. I was your host, Hainga Okwemba. Until next time, it's goodbye for now. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Hainga Okwemba. Uh, for that uh, conversation with uh, Professor Chris Wanjala, uh, which reveals, I think, uh, the critical debates uh, in, in East African literature and also uh, African African literature, uh, where he talks about issues to do with, uh, I mean, the defining debates in East Africa. Is East Africa a literary, uh, is it a literary desert? Yeah, uh, he also talks about things to do with uh, cultural uh, nationalism. How do we uh, assert our presence uh, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a region and even a, as a nation. Uh, also, I think one of the things I picked up earlier on is now, I think it was a spillover from what uh, Fred was talking about, uh, the issue to deal with mentorship, because even uh, Professor Anjala himself admits that he is a product of uh, mentorship and uh, also with regards to literary criticism. And I think uh, that was uh, very uh, insightful uh, to me and also I believe uh, to all of us. Uh, also, thank you to everyone uh, who's uh, engaging with us uh, on the chat box. Uh, I've seen comments from uh, uh, Dr. Osaji, uh, and also I'm seeing uh, some from uh, Professor Iribe Mwangi, uh, who's saying that uh, he can hear uh, a professor speaking, and uh, the professor is in capital. So uh, I think the scholars of literature, you know what uh, that means when one deviates from a small writing in small letters, then uh, uh, capital letters, sorry. Uh, we all know what uh, that means. And I think uh, it's, 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 it's a wonderful session. And also I want to appreciate uh, the presence and acknowledge the presence of uh, Dr. Kitata and also uh, Dr. Simon Peter and even uh, Professor Iribe Mwangi. And um, I can also see uh, Elizabeth Gatungo and uh, Bilha Moenesi. Uh, they're the ones who I can see on my screen. Uh, if I've not seen you, just know that uh, we acknowledge and appreciate uh, your presence. Uh, so uh, I'll invite Tony Mochama uh, to take us through his uh, reflections on, uh, on, on on Professor Chris Wanjala. Uh, Tony Mochama, you're most welcome. Um, thank you very much, Buana San, uh, for moderating this very important session. And I'm just absolutely delighted. I felt, eh, not ghostly, but I felt uh, just a great warmth in listening to that uh, broadcast, somebody said, uh, it's Miriam Usonia who said, uh, Kainga has brought uh, Chris back to life. And uh, that's something, uh, even before I talk about Chris, uh, I'll briefly say it's very, very important to what uh, Kainga or Kemba does eh, with the, the Books Cafe, um, because he's the singular most uh, sort of, he's almost institutional, and you come to realize that uh, Kainga is recording everybody in the arts who matters in the world of books. Kainga has all those records and they're meticulous and uh, he has, he's archiving these moments. And uh, it's only, you know, after the tragic passing of our friends, you know, like uh, Professor Chris, is uh, when you can see this. 
you can hear him back alive. You can hear the important thoughts stretching right back to the 60s. Um, you can hear the ancients uh, brought back uh, in a very contemporary form. So I really want to appreciate um, uh, Kainga, I was going to say professor, for me he's always like a professor, uh, Kainga Okembo, for just that very, very important audio work uh, and archiving of lives that he's doing. I want us to give him a clap. Eh? I'm excited. There are these things called reactions. So you can follow my example and we just, uh, where is the clapping? Okay, there's the, also this one. Yeah, clap, clap, we, we can clap for him. Uh, using these new virtual things. Okay. Thank you. Good, good, good. I'm happy people are doing it. Okay. Right. Now, the first time I met uh, Professor Wanjala was not a happy occasion. It was in the year 2000 at the Senate disciplinary hearings to be discontinued. Eh? And um, he was sitting on that uh, panel in, in the year, yeah, it was the year 2000, I think in March or April. And um, I was being discontinued for, you know, I wish it was for something grand, uh, like, uh, you know, people, it's always politics, like in Hassan Omar, you know, they, they were fighting the Moi regime. But me, I was very busy fighting professors like uh, Patrick Lumumba and others. You know, I used to do what's called guerrilla poetry. Uh, the Nelson Harvey class will tell you this. Well, I would post very nasty poems on the notice boards. Those days, there was no WhatsApp. There was nothing to forward. Uh, so I would stick them, and people would actually take like these poems and uh, photocopy them. And they were very, very nasty. Uh, but I think uh, belligerent, pugnacious, but amusing. Like I remember one, just to give an artistic example, we are in an art session for a guy, the late uh, law contract professor called Nderitu. He was very boring. So I'd write a poem called like Professor Piriton, and I talk about how when he makes love to his wife, it must be like, you know, it should be like drug rape because he's so boring, she can't possibly have con con consented eh, to this act. So it, they were not, uh, they were both, uh, they were sort of a uh, juvenile, uh, but uh, <laughs> very painful in the execution. And, you know, Lumumba wanting to be Martin Luther King, you know, with his voice and so on. So we had this, I call it guerrilla poetry. And uh, Professor Wanjala saved me because I remember people like Indangasi were like, uh, you know, I was the suspect because I foolishly was also doing poetry on campus, like during talent days. I think you still have them. So uh, I can see Helen once they are scratching her head. Eh? But I was foolish because it made me the prime suspect. This girl does spoken word, but also there are these mystery poems eh? in Parkland's law campus. So and anyway, eventually they found out it was me and I'd had some other crimes of truancy. So they combined them. And uh, Professor, Professor Wanjala saved me. Because he was laughing. I mean, there's this evidence. He started, you know, they used to laugh. He was sort of reading quietly. People are looking very stone-faced and, uh, uh, you know, very, the way people in discontinuation committees should look. Uh, and, and, he, and he just started laughing. Like, he was laughing. <laughs> and he said, this is a misguided artist. He said he should come and do literature, you know, in my department. I think the law is making him a bit uh, uh, crazy, a lunatic, he said. So anyway, I wasn't uh, discontinued. I was given a three month suspension and uh, he, he was very key. So he was key in saving my university education, not in the way other people have mentioned uh, positively. He, he saved me during a very negative moment and I graduated the next year in 2001. Um, the next time we were to meet, was post Kwani, when uh, it was Kwani versus the academy. Eh? Yeah, we used to say the canon, eh? the academy was the canon with one N, and then as we were the canon, like in Abinyavanga with two Ns. So we are shooting at the canon, and uh, we had very lively um, uh, literary debates in the pages of the newspapers in the mid OOs, the mid aughts, 2004, 5, 6. And Prof, eh, for all his gentlemanly mien, you know, he was very, he could be very savage 
kwa gazeti eh? there was no smile there he could, could be very cutting and he could be scathing and uh, of course we had no respect uh, i must say for our elders at that time we were still young and hot blooded and uh, kwani was you know was sort of like the thing so we are saying we have sold the literary desert that this was says put us in um, you know the pasalelos kahoras and so on and uh, this new breed ivona wars and uh, well the rest of them in the hot wakina enok i can see matundura is here so wakina enok will remember those days eh za kugongana and i, I was very we would have very entertaining uh, cultural quarrels i must say with like people like us on one side and chris on the other side and i remember we exchanged one or two um, nasty eh, across the standard and the nation <laughs> so you would write in the nation and i write in the standard uh, on successive saturdays but then something changed chris was always the first person to leave any ivory tower yes he was a great academic but he was always a young man at a kikwam ze he still youthful he was youthful in mind and at some point he deserted he left work in endangasi fighting those battles akavuka sakafu he just decided you know there's um, there's this new things are happening and rather than stick uh, like a word of chingam to the bottom of a shoe uh, to 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 certain uh, uh, what we call ivory tower ways he crossed he crossed the floor uh, he was one of very very few so he was courageous in that way and then um, and by the time i met him now properly through pen uh, pen international pen kenya way was uh, the chairman i think of translation and linguistics we clicked eh, when we first met eh, because of course like a lot of people i'm sure have uh, testified just because of his warmth his laughter uh, his intellect his stories his experiences he was like a, he wasn't like a normal you know a, a academician who sometimes acts like they have stick stuck up their asses he was a very flexible and warm and mouthful man and uh, we became fast friends on um, uh, kainga started getting us going for a lot of these pen trips some to coast but mostly to western uh, so we would go to western and to eldoret and you know to nyanza and back to western and um we would laugh like schoolboys yeah you know we used to like sitting next to each other and sort of sometimes sengenyeng eh when people are talking is the professor but he's like the schoolboy eh? eh, people will attest to that he was like a naughty schoolboy so uh, you know um there would be many light moments with him interspersed of course with the uh, whatever intellectual missions had taken us uh, you know to to this like pen pens pen clubs mostly consisting of students of you know english and literature and poetry and journalism and um those are moments i still think of with you know with great poignancy with great poignancy the trips that we would just be with him for hours uh, you know sharing meals and mostly just laughing and laughing over you know drinks late into the night uh, with uh, you know kainga and maximilia and faith on air and uh, uh, jacob okay it's and the, the the pen people eh the pen kenya uh, people and i'll say his last battle was a very important one his last uh, and this is the last thing i'll talk about for now was uh, for the cultural bill prof agreed that we have a problem with culture like uh, in this country yeah we used to say it's always a ministry that even when it was a ministry it would be where more you would take ministers you wants to punish next to being sacked you are taken to the ministry of culture because it was toothless yeah it was a hen a hen without teeth yeah? a headless chicken even we could say just just not a headless chicken at least then they run around eh? but uh, like when timama was removed from lands is taken to culture eh? You are, you are punished eh? it's your it's your siberia eh? cabinet siberia 
before you are sacked or you don't reform. And that has never changed because uh, in a country where graft, uh, uh, President Uru himself admitted it, and we said this even with Professor Lucorito back then, uh, where there's wastage of two billion per day, like in a in lost money, which is just a, the corruption machine, it's uh, a third of our two trillion GDP. That's two billion shillings a day. It's amazing that this uh, nothing ever happens in culture. We have had Utamaduni Day uh, just a few days ago, 10th, I think like two weeks ago, is it? 10th, today is 26, 16 days ago. There was a dead silence. And that was the me metaphor for what they think of culture in this country. Yeah, m m uh, Heroes Day had the parades and so on, but Utamaduni Day, nobody in the government organized anything. Not even that ministry, I've even forgotten who's there. I know it's either with youth sports. Is it still Amina or did she get fired? But, uh, you know, we know it for Arabi stars losing five zeros and that uh, man, the Kamba who has the voice like a, like a wind instrument. But what are we saying? Professor Chris was fighting for the cultural bill, a bill that at least gets some government resources, money, infrastructure, uh, uh, in a national cultural bill. Uh, we were helping him on that campaign with Hainga and the rest of Penn, and he had drafted, we helped to draft a very, very nice uh, sort of cultural bill where we are supposed to do things like grants, you know, writers' grants, art artists' grants. How much is that to, you know, create projects, uh, uh, book project money that cannot even be competitive? Yeah, because we have outsourced everything in this country when it comes to culture, to the French, the French Cultural Center, to British Council, to the British, to the Italians, and uh, yeah, and, and just European powers, our old colonial powers are the ones who run uh, the cultural agenda in this country. And uh, Prof had, was really pushing for that bill. And I think uh, it was among our last trips ever. I think we were deeper and so on. We went to, I think it was Machakos and there was some Zungu called uh, Bill Riley, I believe. But um, sadly, th that last battle was never won because uh, as we speak, and in the twilight of this uh, government, this thing, this Uhuru government, whatever has happened to the Atuko Pamoja, the fact is that that bill, the Professor Chris was a key proponent of, it's lying literally in a dusty wardrobe somewhere in the Attorney General's office. And we all know what is going to happen the next few months. We are entering November. So we have November, December, and seven months. So these months are pregnant forgive the nine month plan. We have nine months to the general elections and, the, and it will be pregnant with politics, eh? not with things like culture. So we can say the life of this current parliament and the life of the Hururu regime that was uh, to bring to fruition uh, the cal national culture bill, culture is still as dead as it was when his father was doing Nyakinyura, Nyaki, what are they called? Nyakinyura dances those old women who would dance for him. That's what the idea of culture still in, is in this country. Something Chris was very against. He used to say, literature is alive. People still think of culture like the museum where Leakey left the fossils, Kenya National Museum. People say that's culture. They think of it as dead documents in the Kenya National Archives. They are near ambassador and the bus stop and so on. And uh, so it's not that literature is dead. It's just that uh, it has no legs to stand on, national legs. And it doesn't matter that the 2010 constitution, Chris used to say that was our key weapon. It talks about culture uh, very, very early about our national culture, the supreme law of the land, the sovereign will of the people. But it is dead letters, it's dead constitutional letters. And a bill that uh, uh, Professor Angela helped to draft I bet is a, you know, in the bottom drawer. I know it's in the bottom drawer of a, this at current attorney general. I have even forgotten his name. I remember Githu Mengai because you know, he was our old lecturer and a very smart man. But even with him, even with Githu Mengai who loved books and so on, they have let that bill to die. 
or rather to, to rust or to rot uh, in the drawers. And uh, a legacy of his, uh, a season of harvest would be if hopefully the next government, eh, maybe barbers, let's say, uh, because we know the other fellow, I'm not doing politics here, but the other fellow has said history, English, these are very useless things. He has said it's bottoms up and stems, science, technology, and maths. Eh? He says, who knows, who cares about Vasco da Gama or Ibn Batuta or literature? So hopefully, if the next government is not by that fellow, if it's uh, by the other likely fellow, uh, like Baba, hopefully, uh, these are conversations that uh, we will revive and we should revive eh, uh, in memory of uh, Dr. Chris uh, Wanjala, whom I truly hope uh, is smiling down on us because he can't help it. Eh? You'd only be smiling. That beautiful beauty, the man had a beautiful smile and a very infectious laugh. Even when I think about it, uh, one does not feel like crying. When you remember Chris, one remembers him you know, very warmly with a smile. Uh, what a wonderful man uh, he was. What a wonderful, wonderful man he was. And we were very lucky to have had him for three quarters of a century. And for me, I feel very lucky to have known him and laughed with him and loved him for the better part of what he did. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Tony. I was reading what uh, 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 Jeff Usaji and P.O.D. Odongo are saying here. Usaji is uh, actually appreciating uh, your, your, your comments uh, on, on, uh, on, on Professor Wanjala by saying that Tony Mochama has ne nearly brought the house down uh, with, his, uh, with, his, with his humorous canon round, brilliant memories, Tony, his brilliant memories, Tony. His presentation gingerly oscillates between two polarities, humor and irreverence to euphemism. He has enriched us with a personal account of his experience with Professor Lucorito. Uh, P.O.D. is saying, if you have Tony Mochama for a friend, designate him as the only person to talk at your funeral. That is if you're not brave enough to write your own eulogy. Uh, thank you very much, Tony, for that uh, presentation. Uh, I remember a brief interaction years back during the Story Moja Festival. When uh, you, 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 I remember that analogy when you say that uh, you are accused of writing uh, a literary dissertation as opposed to writing a legal uh, dissertation for your undergraduate studies. So, you know, it was, uh, it, it's always been uh, fascinating to hear you talk uh, and also uh, your sense of humor. Now, uh, I think we will listen to uh, Anwar Wright and then uh, uh, lastly, we listen to Grace Wamboy. Uh, who will uh, move uh, the vote of thanks. And I think uh, as, as Grace moves the vote of thanks, I'll, I'll request us, uh, those who are able, uh, to switch on your camera so that we can take uh, a photo uh, the online way. And also I think I'm in agreement with maj a majority of us who have spoken today that maybe someday uh, when uh, it is possible, we will have a physical colloquium on uh, Professor Anjala and also have publications in his uh, memory and his honor. So, uh, Anwar Wright, if you are here with us, uh, you can uh, you can you can take over. Okay. So, I hope you are fine. Um, um, Anwar Wright Indoshi, I'm a student at UNKU. Um, I take BD and I'm a literature major. So um and um since um training to be a teacher uh decided to look of one of the set texts that was compiled and edited by Chris Wanjala that is memories we lost. So of the four set texts I read in high school, I loved a short story anthology, Memories We Lost, compiled by Chris Wanjala. I did not know who Chris Wanjala was until I met a writer who I asked if he knew him. And he said he did. And um, after that, he later said that um, he knew him as a professor and uh, 
an editor and had once met him. And um, when he met him, they talked about his writings and had encouraged him to write in his own language, Luya. And the writer was not pleased with the idea of Professor Wanjala telling him to write in Luya uh, since he was concerned about not getting a readership. And the writer, however, had talked of Chris being a good literary critic and editor. We went on to talk about Austin Bukenya and the talk shows about books and even talked about Professor Egara Kabaji. Later in the day, I had uh, searched for um, I had searched Professor Chris Wanjal on the internet and the first article that popped up was that of Alexandra Opicho, which described Chris as a practical feminist, a good editor and a writer, and also a scholar. And so then I concluded that Chris was a practical feminist, a literary critic, a scholar, and a man who was proud of his language, Lubukusu. To me, Chris was a man with a good taste as he had uh, compiled the anthology with the good stories. Memories We Lost. Um, Memories We Lost introduced me to great African writers such as Leila Abulela, Buduwayo Afolabi, Lidudu Malingani, and uh, Okuri Oduor, whom I have continued to read to date. Um, Memories We Lost <clears throat> addressed mental, mental illness, schizophrenia, which I had never heard of, Light by Neka. A rima about parenting, missing out by Leila Bolela on immigrants and uh, women, hitting Budapest by Novilet Novi Blue Wire. Uh, I, however, was introduced to also great writers such as Leo Tolstoy and um, Garcia Gabriel, whom uh, I still read them. Um, <clears throat> one of my teachers, Avedi, had loved. Um, one short story by Okuri Odor, My Father's Head, just the same way he had loved Betrayal in the City, that he dramatized all the characters as we read as class in class. A play another teacher didn't like because it had ghosts. I wonder if the ghosts, it was the ghosts she disliked or the idea that someone had written about them. Um, <clears throat> we read the book with pride just as we had been influenced by our teacher. However, during the extravaganza, I did not like the way people argued. Extravaganzas were kind of symposiums that we used to have in school where we would argue on um, books and uh, thematic concerns in um, books. So, and uh, during that time, uh, when it came to arguing about the short story, um, my father's head. I didn't love how the teachers and other students were arguing that Opio um, Duor uh, was murdering, had murdered the protagonist of the story, um, who was the father of Stimbi, and uh, that meant that the book was feministic. And uh, and <clears throat> so I didn't like that they ignored the language and style that Okuri had uh, labored to use, the humor, and uh, also the plot that had not been developed that well, but still the story was one that I was proud to read. However, I didn't stand to argue with them because um, I fear talking in front of people. And uh, I also thank God that this is virtual. Um, <clears throat> so, and I thought there is more to books than the, just themes and that is pride. And that is what I learned through the short story anthology. Uh, I learned about the, char the characters, how Odor um, developed his characters, which were unique, nameless and odd. Um, he described, he dis she described some of the characters as maybe an old man, then men knocking at the door, um, and the ideas were jumbled up. And at one time, Simbi is, is at the old 
at the old people's home and another she's at her house and recalling her how her father died. Uh, grief is one of the things that stood out as I read the book, how we react to grief without a thought on good things or bad side of the dead, how everything reminds us of the dead. And um, we see that um, <clears throat> Okurio Dwar does describe uh, Father Ignatius. So Simbi is reminded of his father as Father Ignatius is pouring some tea in the mug. And um, she wonders whether it's the way uh, Father Ignatius pours the tea uh, to the point of it overpouring or is the way he poured the tea. Um, as I live, I'm certain that I will teach literature with pride and incite my students to read more books by Africans. I do not despise any other literature, but I do love how I relate to and with African literature. And that is learning from memories you lost. And um, I also would love to be a literary critic and I hope maybe I'll just um, be as great as some, um, maybe Chris and the other people who are in the, in the department and um, I'll still teach and <clears throat> champion for learners to read more of African writers and mostly Kenyan writers. Um, we only know of Ngugi. Most people know Ngugi, but when you ask them if they have read Ngugi, they will not have read anything beyond the river between and maybe some just to know him as Ngugi because he's, he's a great writer. And so I, I walk around championing people to read Kenyan works. And even though I know my friends don't like that and they prefer that maybe I should give them other gifts, I still um, visit with a book. And even though my sisters prefer that I would bring them sweets and things, I still buy some books. Um, written by Kenyans and Africans, and I give them. And uh, with that, I just hope I'll be a great writer and a critic and uh, a good teacher of literature. Thank you. Thank you, Sam. Thank you, Wambua, for organizing this. Have a nice time. Uh, thank you uh, very much, uh, Anwright, for your uh, presentation. I think uh, you, you, you say that you go and uh, incite your students to read. So mine is to give you uh, the great commission then, uh, go ye and make disciples of African literature, baptizing them in whoever's name you choose. Uh, anyway, uh, thank you uh, very much, uh, Anwarite. Uh, I had seen uh, Professor Museli had raised her hand. I don't know if she's still here uh, with us. Uh, Maybe she can uh, say something. She had raised her hand before we uh, listened to Chris. Uh, but if not, I, I, I now since uh, Anwarit has told us about inciting people, I was thinking of inciting uh, some of my teachers who are here uh, to say something. Uh, I'm seeing uh, Dr. Musonye on my screen. Uh, I'm also seeing uh, Professor Iribe Mwangi, even though he didn't teach me uh, maybe uh, he might also uh, be incited. But I think as we wait for Professor Musonye to gather her thoughts, uh, I'm seeing Dr. Kitata has raised his hand. Yes, Dr. Okay. Thank you very much, Sam, for, for in this forum to celebrate Professor. And thank you, Kimengichi and Paul Mwindi for making this such a wonderful afternoon. I, I want to relate uh, uh, some experience I went through this afternoon. I was having a class of East African oral literature and I decided to come to this webinar and I told all my students to come to this webinar because I believe that Professor Wanjala is a subject in school. 
and I'm glad to see most of my students in this webinar. <clears throat> um, what I have to say is that we have gotten a lot from Professor as a colleague and as a friend. Uh, professor is someone who has affected us and influenced us in the way we think about literature in Kenya and particularly in the Department of Literature. And I'm happy to say that we, we proudly we proudly celebrate Professor Wanjala because he has some demands on our intellectual journeys and he affects our intellectual conscience. And so we celebrate him without any shame. If you go to conferences on oral literature across Africa, you'll find some people who mention Professor Wanjala proudly, and they celebrate him there. So why not do it here in Kenya? <clears throat> and what I take home from today's presentation is what was said by Professor Mwanzi about Professor Wanjala's contribution to the study of oral literature in Kenya. Uh, uh, Professor Wanjala gave us the energy and the methods to study oral literature in Kenya, especially in the way he showed us how to study performance arts in Western Kenya, especially the Litungu and Kumuse historical lyricists. And not forgetting that Professor was also the founder of Kenya Oral Literature Association. And so mine is to thank those who have shown up, especially my students and the organizers for giving us such an opportunity to celebrate Professor Wanjala. And thank you very much. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Kitata, for, if I might use Anu Wright's word, for inciting your students uh, to join us today. Uh, we are very much happy uh, to have them. Uh, Dr. Musonya, I don't know if uh, you have something to say. Okay, uh, it seems uh, she does not. Uh, so, but I think if you have anything, so you can just uh, raise your hand and uh, we'll uh, give you uh, the platform. Uh, I can't see any raised hand. So I'll invite uh, Grace uh, to move uh, the vote of thanks and also uh, request those of you. Oh, I'm seeing Simon Peter has raised his hand. So uh, Simon, uh, Dr. Simon Peter, you can, you can take over. Uh, thank you, Sam. I, I hope people can hear me. Yes, you can. I hope people can hear me. We can, Dr. Tari. Uh, can you hear me? Dr. Tari, yeah, we can, can hear you. Can you hear us? Yes, Aska, I can hear you, Tony. You are quite okay. clear. Yes, we can hear you too, sir, uh, Dr. Oh, thank you. Thank yeah. you very much. Um, um, I, let me start by apologizing. I came a little late. Uh, largely because I had some technical issues somewhere, and also because Dr. Kimengichi tricked me and led me wherever I was, and we were to come here. Um, let me also just mention uh, Professor Wanjal, who was a um, person you could ignore. Uh, when we, uh, I remember he was teaching. I don't remember so much, which later uh, bumped into him, my colleague at the Department of Data, is um, we used to talk about myths when he was taught the Greek means writing. Uh, and uh, when he said that the myths are 
that we can is perfect, right? So when I met him here, league, we always uh, and he will, uh, you know, say that when you professor, you know, the professor, you know, looking at a professor. And when a professor looks at you, professor, you look, and you need to, and he will laugh that early. And it, it is true, a professor is like a muse. And therefore, a professor, you know, incites people to write. And that became the joke. One very interesting thing is a week before he passed on, I met him uh, next the clock, just next to Gandhi Wing here. Well, he looked really well, and uh, I was telling him, Prof, look to young people don't muse then, and him that I would, you know, I would pay professorial look and a discussion. And he laughed thoroughly. I was, actually, I was really shocked to hear that he had passed on. But what I'm saying here in short is that Prof was a very memorable character and um, very encouraging. I do remember long before we, we were even talking about uh, induction of theater and film studies, Prof would approach me and tell me something thinking about performing arts so that you can break away the Department of Literature and literature Department. And good ideas actually about the education of, and how literature will service the sub departments and so on and so forth. So these are memories I would like to cherish, and I, I hope I'll be able to write them down. And uh, of course, thank everybody else in the community who took a left way uh, for organizing such a successful and uh, uh, very much. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Simon Peter Tino, uh, for. Uh, your reflections on uh, on, on on Professor uh, Wanjala. Now, uh, since there is no other hand raised, I think mine is just to uh, thank everyone of you uh, who joined us today. I think we were over 100 participants uh, at some point. So uh, I want to thank you, uh, the organizers, uh, the 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 chair LSA. This is Paul Wambua Mwindi. Uh, Dr. Kimingichi Wabende, who's uh, the patron, and also the chair, uh, Professor General Dwar, uh, for staying with us uh, to the end. And even uh, the, the panelists, uh, Tony Mochama, Hainga Okwemba, uh, Professor Mwanzi, and even uh, Dr. Kitata for uh, asking his uh, students to join us today. Uh, now, I'll invite Grace to move uh, the vote of thanks. I would like to take this chance to thank everyone who has been part of this commemoration, our speakers and our audience, most keenly our dear lecturers here at the university, Dr. Kimingichi, our LSA patron, Prof. Hel Hel Helen for your lively contributions that reflected on the personal side of the late Prof. Mr. Sam for your moderation and Dr. Alex Wanjala. Our, uh, our appreciation also pours out to Hainga Okwemba for that audio recording, Tomo Shama with your live anecdotes, Fred Frederick Kimodo and Anya Laitindoshi for your testimonials that touched on the value of mentorship. Now that we have come to the end of a webinar, I'd like us to embrace the, the literature spirit and commitment to our leaders and literature in general. I believe that this is only the end of the beginning. Thank you, everyone. Thanks to uh, Wambua for being part of this web memorial webinar. Yeah, that's all. Okay. Uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, 
I think we can call it an evening and uh, goodbye. The photo some goodbye and the photo oh, yeah. I, 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 I took uh, i took some photos oh okay fine we can turn on our cameras now i was taking some but uh, some of some of the uh, cameras are off so if you're in a position to turn on your camera just uh turn it on yes uh, for the camera. Uh, let me let me make a request don't don't uh, comment because if you comment, it will pop up and it will interfere with uh, the photo. <laughs> yeah. The comments are also part of the conversation. <laughs> uh, they, they will block some people. Block and some don't people. Want, uh, I don't want them to cast me for not taking good pictures. <laughs> okay, uh, let me, I'll, I'll let you know. Let me, I'll, I'll let you know. Uh, Okay. Uh, just hold it if you have your camera on. Just Uh, the last one, I'm taking the last one now. Okay, uh, thank you very much uh, for, for turning on your cameras and also for uh, being with us here uh, today.